Um, so welcome to Innovations in Transparency. I'm Samantha Barry. I'm a social media producer with BBC World News. And this is the final session for you all of the day, so we're hoping it, it'll be a fun one. We've got a great panel, and we're going to look at innovations in transparency. And I hope we'll do about half an hour of talking, maybe half an hour of questions from you all. Um, and I think with this panel, I'm hoping that you take away, in particular if you're journalism students, um, you take away some um, idea of what direction to go and look at if you, you're interested in new in innovations you can use in transparency. So I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel. So at the end we have Will Moy. Am I pronouncing that right? Um, he is the director of Full Fact, um, and that is a, an organisation that fact checks claims from politicians, interest groups, and journalists. How, Will's had a very busy week um, fact checking the debate in Paris um, about whether the UK should stay part of Europe. Um, next to me, I've got Luke Lewis, who's the UK editor of BuzzFeed. And when you talk about innovations, BuzzFeed's doing a lot of innovative stuff, in particular in terms of journalism. So I'm really interested to see what Luke's going to say. Next to me is Sarah Marshall, who's the social media editor for the Wall Street Journal in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And some of you might know her in her previous role, which was technology editor at journalist.co.uk. And Eric Newton at the end, who's obviously doing a lot of talking today. He's just come out of one panel. He is special advisor um, at the Knight Foundation and the, the previously the founder of the First Amendment Project. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to kick off with each of the panelists giving maybe five to ten minutes and talking about what they think are new innovations in transparency in journalism. And I think they... All four of them have very different takes on what, what that title means. Do you want to start, Will? Uh, not particularly, but, <laughs> but all right. <laughs> um, I, I feel somewhat outranked on the panel, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, firstly, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all um, at the end of, uh, as Sam says, what's been a very, very busy week for us. I was slightly taken aback by being asked to talk about innovation in transparency, not least because I think I don't and possibly nobody else knows what either innovation or transparency is really meant to mean. Um, but it did strike me when I started thinking about it that actually it's really interesting that what Full Fact does wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Um, sitting in the spin room of the Clegg versus Farage debate down the road from here, uh, eight of us, eight of the full fact team turning out there, fact checking in real time what the candidates were saying, responding, briefing journalists, being part of the LBC live blog, um, being out there on Twitter explaining his, you know, the shades of grey, those black and white statements aren't giving you, actually they've got the wrong end of that stick, and so on. It's amazing, firstly, to have the ability to gather that information at that pace, and secondly, to have the ability to disseminate that information um, to an audience which genuinely is in a position to think critically about what politicians are saying in real time. When have we really had that ability before, unless you happen to be sitting with a friend who happens to know about the topic? So actually, somewhere in this, a whole lot of things are changing, and it, it doesn't feel, you know, it's not all about technology. It doesn't feel really techy, but actually underlying it is all about technology driving that innovation. And I was, I was thinking about this talk, and I decided to do something which, as a fact checker, you never really get to do, which is make a wild and probably groundless assertion just because it sounds interesting to me. Um, I think one day when people come to write the history of journalism and technology, it's entirely possible that they may point to just two major developments as the things that really changed everything. The first, I think, is the hyperlink. And the second, I think, will be what Sam introduced me to the term robo-journalism, computers doing journalism on their own. And when you think about what Full Fact does, it's largely driven by hyperlinks. It's driven by the ability to trace people's claims back to where they came from, the ability to search for sources, the ability, crucially, to point our users to the sources we use. Because the point of full fact as a fact-checking organisation isn't to tell people, here's the answer, take our word for it, here's a new source of authority and just defer to us, is to tell people, here's the sources, make your own mind up, 
and by the way, we cut, cut away a lot of the work for you. And I find that really interesting because at the moment, when you look at a lot of the areas of innovation around presenting data, which is a huge area of growth in journalism at the moment, what we're seeing is those hyperlinks disappearing. Infographics are possibly the least traceable way of presenting data you could possibly wish for. A lot of our online data tools actually leave the user helpless, and that's a really ironic thing to have encountered on the internet. If you've ever sat there looking at a graph which says at the bottom of it, source, colon, office for national statistics, you don't know whether to be grateful that there's a source at all or to cry that you have to go to the <coughs> Office for National Statistics website and look among their hundreds of thousands of data sets for what you're looking for. I think there is a challenge, which I hope, full fact, we'll find some way to get into over the next year or two to ask, how do we overcome that problem? I was talking to guys from the FT data blog a while back and saying... When we publish a photo, we always attribute it. You always get those little watermark, watermarks saying Getty images, that kind of thing. When we publish a graph, that doesn't happen. And it certainly doesn't happen in anything like a modern, transparent way of actually linking to the data we're actually talking about. That has to change. So partly I'm here to throw out a challenge rather than say how we do things. But in the cause of helping you guys as journalists, as uh, would-be journalists, I guess some of you, uh, one of the things Full Fact has done is build a tool called Full Fact Finder. Uh, Full Fact Finder, which you can find at fullfact.org slash finder, not surprisingly, <laughs> is your guide to the best sources of information in core public policy areas, the economy, crime, health, immigration, and education. It will get you in three clicks from its homepage to the data set you need direct links. It's basically what we wish the ONS website was. Um, so that may be of use to you and I commend it to you. Um, I mentioned robo-journalism. Um, I'm just going to leave that one hanging I think um, because I, I suspect Eric might have something to say about it. But it is certainly the case that it is more and more possible for elements of journalism to be replaced by what computer programs can do. And I think that presents a really interesting challenge as to what is the bit of journalism that um, people are adding real value to. Um, and for us, as fact checkers, it's an opportunity. How can we dramatically speed up fact checking using computers? Um, and I, I'm just going to leave that question hanging for now. Thank you. Luke, do you want to tell us what you think innovation in journalism Well, I believe into the swap seats so the, you can... The phrase robo-journalism really excites me. I don't, think I don't know if I've missed the point, but in my head it's just Robocop <laughs> <laughs> with a dictaphone. <laughs> um, I've actually been a bit of a spot and, and prepared some slides, so I don't know, is there a clicker? Or is, can anyone help me show these slides? Uh, okay, so yeah, as I was saying uh, earlier, I think Alan Rusbridger was here, and he was asked if he thought of BuzzFeed as a competitor. And uh, somewhat dismissively, he said, well, BuzzFeed's only been around for three minutes. Uh, we've been around for a little bit longer than three minutes, it's, uh, but we are pretty new. So we've only been publishing in the UK for like, pretty much exactly a year. Uh, in, in the US, they've only really been uh, doing news since about 2012. So it's pretty new for us, and we are still learning. Um, in terms of like innovation, I suppose I don't feel that... We're not like the guys who are out in, in war zones wearing Google Glass. There's no sort of uh, tricks like that. Um, but innovation for us, I suppose, is just trying to make f uh, news, and in particular foreign reporting, which is where we're focused at the moment, um, as accessible as possible. You know, so uh, BuzzFeed writers, we do think a lot about not only what is a story, but how you then make that story travel on social media, how you make it spread like wildfire. So a lot of what we do is really thinking about how to, how to present news in, uh, and thinking very visually. So as before I say that, this is, given this is a conference, I have to show you a really boring graph. Uh, this is just uh, showing that in February, uh, BuzzFeed was the world's biggest publisher on Facebook. So I just show that just because it shows that's where our traffic comes from, really, social media. Um, a lot of other news publishers, um, their traffic comes, comes from search engines, search engines still, BuzzFeed. The vast majority of the traffic comes from um, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. So 
This is kind of what like a viral news story looks like on BuzzFeed. Uh, it's, it's in the form of a list. It is uh, the images, the photos fill the screen. Uh, we don't have display advertising on BuzzFeed. Uh, we just do, we do sponsored posts. So what that means is that there's no, there's no banners getting in the way, there's no pop-ups, there's nothing intrusive. Uh, it really is a question of letting the content, uh, really giving it as much impact as possible. That's really important to us. And uh, so this kind of format that, that we built over, over several years of, which was really created to, uh, in the service of fun, shareable lists, uh, that format, we find, is actually works very well for explaining very serious topics and really giving it a lot of impact. This is one example, 29 heartbreaking images from the protests in Venezuela. As you can see, you know, that had a lot of, lot of views and it was as widely shared as any of our sort of more light-hearted content. And uh, when, when you present things like this where you really let the images do the work, it does sort of leave you open to a, a criticism, which is, well, perhaps you're not really giving the context. And uh, so one guy wrote an article for Slate, and he coined this word apocalyptical. And so we, he, he, his argument is that we had popularised this form of journalism where you just kind of, everything is, is just dramatic photos, and everything is heartbreaking or extreme or dramatic. Um, and I think what my response to that was is that that's not all we do. You know, we then do also do the deep dive. So we've got, like a, in um, our guy in Kiev, uh, Max Seddon, you know, he did produce some articles that were very image-led and very high impact, like this. But then he also did some really you know, in-depth on-the-ground reporting. That stuff is not viral. It's not widely shared. Uh, but the important thing is to do both. And I think the value of this kind of journalism is it, it's, it's super accessible. So a person who might not have been interested in what's happening in Venezuela, that article will grab their attention. And, and then you've got their attention, and then hopefully they will, they will read more. I can't remember what the next slide was. Another example of the same thing. And the next one? Okay, so the, re the reason I show this is when we think about accessibility and uh, making content uh, that, really, that really travels on the social web, it's, it's really a lot to do with thinking about mobile phones. Uh, so uh, on average, about 70% of our traffic comes, comes with mobile devices, but then when you have a big sort of runaway hit, it skews as high as 70 or 80%. And so in order to sort of force our eyes to think about content on, an, on a phone, this is what our content management system looks like. So you see in the right-hand rail, as you're writing a story, it shows you what, it looks, what it's going to look like on a phone. So as a writer, that does kind of sharpen your thinking, and it forces you to... Th when, you, when, you, when you see an article uh, on that device, uh, a large block of sort of impenetrable text look, looks even more impenetrable. So it does encourage you to think more in terms of uh, images and the visual presentation of an article. And uh, in fact, we have, we have a little bit of technology which means that you can send the draft article to your own phone so you can see it on your actual own device. So I think that's really useful, just a way of like, forcing writers to think about mobile. Is that unique to BuzzFeed, that content the management system? Being able, yes, yeah. But I think, I think uh, The Guardian have it to this idea of mobile preview. I think other publishers do have it. And uh, so, yeah, a content management system was kind of built to facilitate the very sort of rapid creation of fun, shareable lists. Uh, but it, it turns out, as we've moved more into serious content, that same platform lends itself incredibly well to explaining complex topics because it, it forces you to think in, in quite a sort of a step-by-step -step and uh, very clear manner. And this is just one example of an article that did really well for us. A guy from The Economist called Daniel Knowles, he wrote this for us, 15 facts that reveal the utter insanity of Britain's housing market. And each one of those 15 facts was illustrated by a graph, a photo, or an animated GIF. And uh, he, he was really blown away by it because he was used to writing very uh, wordy, written through pieces of The Economist and not getting much feedback. He ne didn't really get much sense that people were, were reading it and engaging with it. Uh, but when he wrote for BuzzFeed, he was like, well, this is th this manner of explaining things is actually really, really powerful. And so this was a very, very popular article. And again, it was as widely shared as, as any of the sort of sillier, uh, funnier kind of things we do. Uh, I should say <laughs> the reason I include this is because, you know, we are very much in this world of, like, viral news. And uh, everyone, a lot, we have a lot of competitors in that field as well. So everyone wants to write an article that, that goes viral. And so that does lead you to everyone's kind of seeking out the same stories. 
But the problem with that is that viral news is often, is often a hoax. And so this is, this is one example of a story that went absolutely crazy. Everyone was, was uh, sharing this on Twitter. It was a picture that purported to show a python having swallowed a drunk guy in India. Uh, I don't think it was in India. It was years and years ago. It was a really old picture, and um, it wasn't a drunk guy. It was like a deer or something. Uh, but so because these, things, these, these hoaxes keep happening, it becomes more and more important as a new kind of journalistic skill is, is image verification. And so debunking hoaxes is a really big part of what we do. And, and it's actually, for, for any young journalists here, I mean, it's, it's actually very easy. So that particular story, to, to debunk that, took ab about 30 seconds. You just find the image, you do a reverse Google image search, and, you, you know, you can see the history of that image. It's very clear that it's either been photoshopped or it's very old. But, uh, yeah, so the reason I in include this was just uh, this. It, it's important as well as thinking about you know, how to sort of turbocharge your, your articles like for social media and all, the, all that stuff, uh, you do need to get scoops as well. And that is, that is hard work. And so you need reporters who have uh, contacts, you need they who have experience. And this is something, something that takes time. So this was a, a scoop we had, a guy called John Stanton in the US. And he got that because of his, he had contacts in, in the State Department. And so, so that kind of reporting, that's kind of we're in it for the long haul. So um, we definitely want to get to the point where BuzzFeed is as uh, respected for news as, as anyone in the world, the likes of The Guardian or The New York Times. Uh, but those things, uh, yeah, they do take time. They take years to build up, to build up that level of trust. Um, but hopefully uh, we will get there, and uh, it'll take us longer than three minutes or whatever I'm just said we have been around for. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, um, yeah, I'm Sarah Marshall. I'm social media editor for Europe, Middle East and Africa, which, uh, which I, a job I started in December at the Wall Street Journal. There's a team of us, so uh, I take over from my colleague in Asia when I come in in the, in the morning and then hand over to my colleagues in New York. Uh, so it's kind of very much a global news organisation. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you, just kind of give three examples of things that we've done recently, three big news stories that you'll all be aware of, and three very global news stories. And I'm sure that you're aware that yesterday there was a story that Turkey, ahead of the elections, which take place on Sunday, uh, is banning YouTube. And last week there was a story about banning Twitter and actually trying to get this kind of bird back in the cage is proving pretty tricky, I think. So, of course, one of the kind of joys of being at the journal is you have this army of reporters. We've got almost 2,000 journalists around the world. So we've got 10 people in Turkey, 9 or 10 reporters in Turkey. Um, we've got a Turkish language site, so we report both in Turkish and for the global site. So we've got people writing there both in English and Turkish. And so all I did kind of when, when you know, the, the ban started and ahead of the elections is kind of one of the things that I think we try and do a lot at the journal is connect the readers directly with our with our reporters so that they can get the news in real time. So I'm kind of thinking about, you know, we're thinking about real-time transparency and letting people know the situation on the ground in a particular area. And then um, kind of another thing that we've done a couple of times recently is Reddit AMAs, Ask Me Anything. So after the Twitter ban last week, uh, I think it was Monday, the Joe... Parkinson, who is our Istanbul bureau chief, he went on to Reddit for two hours to answer questions. And for us, you know, it's a really nice thing for the journal to do because it arguably introduces a new audience to our experts, our people on the ground, our really kind of, you know, people who are really close to the story. And from Turkey to the situation in Ukraine and Crimea, Russia, and Paul Sonne. Now, Paul Sonne was part of, I think we had 16 uh, reporters at Sochi, and straight away, of course, all of them kind of get dispatched to different areas and don't get the break they were hoping for after working kind of 20 hours a day for three weeks. And Paul Sonne is this kind of incredible American guy who, uh, young guy who speaks... Uh, 
Russian who's got this encyclopedic knowledge of Russian history and if you want to see the Russian history just go back and look at his tweets from the opening ceremony of Sochi and he kind of explains everything as the ceremony is happening it's really kind of very impressive what he does this was a photo he took arguably it's not a great picture uh, but this was one of the first pictures that that went out it was one of the first the first ones I we saw on social at the journal of this kind of moment in time when the flags are changing you know, by being able to connect readers, and we often we've got 4.2 million people who follow our main Wall Street Journal account by just retweeting Paul and allowing readers to connect directly with journalists <coughs> who are on the ground, who are in the moment who are in real time, is kind of really important for us, um, so this is kind of a, a nice example, and we were able to also bring those in on site we've got, um, we do something called a social slideshow, so we bring the images in that our reporters are sharing, and um, in particular locations, obviously, um, we, we kind of theme them, so this one would have been for the story, uh, the ongoing story of, of Ukraine. I tweeted a link to these slides earlier, by the way, if you want to kind of go back and follow these, these great reporters afterwards. Um, another, another one from Paul Sonne, and again, you know, this, this picture says kind of quite a lot, I hope you can see that. Um, you know, th this was taken about two hours after the, uh, the, previous, the previous tweet went out. And then Alan Cullison, another of our reporters in that area. Um, you know, and what I think I like, the reason I picked this tweet in particular was because it does something that's quite journal. What we don't do is kind of try and, you know, we didn't know the facts at this point. We didn't know whose military trucks these, <laughs> these were. So what Alan's doing is just in real time kind of going out there and saying, look, these are military trucks, they don't have markings. It's based on the fact rather than conjecture. And also another example of a, a Reddit AMA, Paul Sonne. You know, it's a confusing subject for some people, and to be able to have an expert and open that expert up so that people can ask questions. We actually asked the people at Reddit about this one, and this one had 50,000 page views, which I think is pretty good. You know, and for, for us at the journal, I think it's really nice to kind of think about those uh, those journalists kind of speaking to new audiences as well. And I'd like to now introduce you to this guy, Sam Dagger. Sam um, is based in Syria. I understand from Sam, and this is him saying it, not me, he, I understand the fact is he is the only American based full-time in Damascus and has been since 2013. Because, of course, a lot of news organizations aren't using freelancers in Syria. Um, but for us, I feel very privileged working for a news organization that has a man in Syria. Um, Sam has been doing a great job of tweeting the war, and there are loads of examples I could give, but I've picked the week in Homs, the evacuation of Homs. There was a Thursday night in February uh, when the UN reached a deal with the Syrian regime, as you're probably all aware. And Sam, you can see the time on this tweet. Well, you probably can't see the time on this tweet, but it says 6.29 a.m. So he gets up super early, takes the road to, from Damascus to Homs. And, you know, it's nice that he's sharing his whole journey with, you know, taking, you, you, taking, taking the reader on that journey with, with, with him. And, you know, and he's explaining the story to people. Again, it's a relatively complicated story, and he's kind of just telling people, um, you know, the, 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 about the deal. So the deal is that the women and children can go, the men has to stay. So it's this kind of very powerful... People have been stuck in homes for 18 months at this point. It's a humanitarian crisis, and Sam is kind of pushing it out there and really, you know, kind of one of the very few journalists who is reporting this story. And the reason I picked this tweet, and there was loads of tweets, I can tell you from the week he reported on the evacuation of Homs, is because, you know, we're talking about transparency, and Sam's not pretending that he's the only journalist there reporting. But actually, by the Monday, he was one of two international Western journalists. It was him and a guy from a Russian TV station. Um, but, you know, he's showing the other cameras. He's showing the local crews there. This is a big story, and he's not trying to, pre 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 you know, pretend that he's the only guy on the scene. The reason I picked this tweet is kind of, you know, he's, it, it's, it's old-fashioned journalism in a way. It's, it's kind of attributing your source. It's saying how you know this particular piece of information and really kind of, you know, going at it in real time. The, the fact that, you know, the, me, the men who are coming out are going to be questioned, they're going to be held. And again, that's something that I think probably some of you are aware of, different examples of people kind of on Twitter when you're kind of telling people what you don't know about a situation. You know, he's, he, he doesn't know whether this ambulance is carrying casualties. It's kind of about the, the uncertainty um, and just being honest with the audience and, and, and transparent in that way. 
And again, some of these tweets we're retweeting from, from we've got a WSJ Mideast account, we've got the main WSJ uh, account, so we're, we're kind of retweeting some of these. Um, and I think um, one of the other things he did, he was obviously very busy reporting. You know, he's, he's, he's a great guy. He's, he's shooting uh, mobile phone footage. He's writing front page stories for the main kind of, you know, American front page news story that's going out in New York the following day and going out to the rest of the world. He's writing stuff for online. He's really kind of, you know, not just tweeting here. He's the only guy on the scene. Um, and, um, you know, he, he's also helping people understand the fact that, you know, I, if I haven't got time to give you all the details at this precise moment, then, you know, you, you'll be able to get them online very shortly. And what I really like is, again, something that perhaps you don't get in the newspaper story, perhaps you don't get online, is, is the kind of human voice. I think it's still objective, I think, but I think it's got a little bit of, you know, he's not saying, okay, you know, I'm with the rebels, I'm with, I'm with uh, Assad, but just showing that kind of human kind of spirit um, in, in the way he's kind of descri describing the dignity that people had during this evacuation. Similarly, I, I really like this tweet. Again, you know, something you might not have in the story, but to me that's kind of an interesting part of the story as a reader, as somebody who's sitting in London reading these tweets. You know, and he's also doing that kind of fact-checking, um, dispelling myth, kind of correcting people who are wrong. You know, saying, t you know, he's saying, I'm there, this is not happening. And of course, it's a subject that a lot of people are very opinionated about, particularly you know, in Syria or the Arab world or who are on one side or the other. This particular tweet, kind of, when he told me about this situation, this was on the Saturday, and actually this was a Saturday which a UN official described as a day in hell. It was a really difficult day. Sam told me that he, he hadn't eaten all day at this point. It's getting late. It's the, the ceasefire is going to end at 6 p.m. And he, he said, you know, at this point, there was two UN officials inside, very senior people. They'd gone in to see the situation inside. And Sam said, he's, you know, he's, he speaks perfect Arabic because he's, he's kind of got Ar uh, Arabic background. And he said he could hear the rebel fighters behind him going, you know, the leader going, my guys are really antsy. That was the word he said to me on the money. My guys are getting antsy. They've not pulled their trigger all day. They really want to fire a gun. And, uh, you know, the te he's got 10 minutes left. He's fearing for his life at this point. You know, that's not an exaggeration. I kind of spoke to him. And, you know, and he's still there tweeting and, you know, really getting the story out. One of the few people who are. So, you know, I kind of have enormous respect for, for, for journalists who can work like that. And then rather than ending on that, I think, you know, end on, as I would on, uh, as Sam would on a tweet, kind of, you know, having that colour, that human voice, that kind of, you know, not just telling the, you know, bare facts of the story, but having that kind of, you know, that life within it, that human voice that really kind of adds something and something that this medium, this kind of Twitter or any kind of real-time reporting can do perhaps in a way that paint print or online or a, another medium can't. So thank you. I'm Eric Newton from Knight Foundation. Can you hear me all right? Um, I'm only here because two brothers and their mother in the United States decided to give their personal fortunes to a foundation, <laughs> which now gives that money back to the communities where they earned it and to the way they earned it, which is journalism and, and media innovation. So we make grants in this area. Uh, to, to both for-profit and, and we make investments in for-profits and grants and non-profits. This is my blog about what I'm about to talk about. So if you want to uh, uh, look later, it's at the Knight blog in, on Knight Foundation's site. And these are some tools that, uh, that we have funded uh, recently. When, I, when Charlie asked me to come here, I first thought, I would talk about some of our golden oldies, meaning they're two years old, which makes them, makes them one digital lifetime ago. And uh, going by Moore's Law. Uh, so here's a couple of golden uh, oldies. This one is uh, Document Cloud, which, allow, which, is a, which is software that lets you do what people have been talking about doing here, which is take massive amounts of documents, use them for your journalists, and publish them to the web and be able to link to them right out of your stories, to be able to link to the underlying source documents. It's being used in uh, hundreds of U.S. newsrooms, and it's maintained by the largest um, uh, investigative reporting organization in the U.S. This one is uh, 
sort of sits on top of that. It's called Overview. It was developed by the Associated Press uh, from one of our contests, and it allows you to look through massive amounts of documents and search for certain words in close proximity with each other. So if you want to find uh, pilots, alcohol, crash, you can look through you know, 10,000 documents and find where those words are close to each other. There are many other ways you can search. Now, earlier today, you heard um, the editor of The Guardian talk about encrypted communication, and, and, um, and this is an encryption system that has all kinds of crazy funders, including us, and uh, it is one of the ways uh, you can communicate online with greater assurance you're not being spied on. Um, uh, Alan was quite disappointed that most journalists are not uh, taking steps. This one's called Timeline JS, and it's out of the Knight Lab at the University of, of uh, North Carolina. And it's interactive timelines, interactive uh, visualization that allows you to click to underlying source material and also uh, have different ways to. Uh, this one's been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. It's being used all over the world by big newspapers and, uh, and other news organizations. Uh, it even allows people to comment on the timelines. It's uh, and there is a suite of other tools at the Knight Lab at Northwestern that you could that you could. Uh, could look at, into. Um, I, I'd like to comment because I think that's a really good point about the stupid infographics in the sense that you can't click through them to anything. That's not a technological problem. That's a, that's a human technology problem. Mm -hmm. It's a technique problem. And it's there, you know, people are making conscious decisions to make stupid graphics. You know that that one cannot that one cannot confirm one can, you not show their work, and I think that's I thought that's an excellent point. And but the problem is not with the digital age; it's with the humans. Um, so there are many others that are sort of golden oldies, two years old, <laughs> and uh, you can learn more about them at News University, which is a free online uh, journalism university that we helped fund. Uh, four digital lifetimes ago, uh, eight years ago, and they do digital tools tutorials that are free online. And so it is, you can learn to use these by going down here to, and, and it has Document Cloud and others that you can learn how to use them. Uh, people of my generation often will spend months thinking that we can't possibly learn them and some of them you can learn in 10 minutes. So best thing to do for people like me is avoid the months and go right to the 10 minutes. Um, and some others that uh, my colleague Ben Wirtz, who's, are you here, Ben? He was here earlier. He's, uh, he's, he's our director of business consulting, and he's based in, uh, for the summer in London. Um, these are some additional tools that Ben recommends I won't go through every single one of them, but these are uh, some of these are for news organizations rather than individual reporters, because they allow for really rich, uh, you know, publishing, uh, and and uh, their businesses. But they have free public components because the freemium model is is is, is uh, working for many of these businesses, where they allow as an individual you can use things. Free um, and uh, and then and then uh, or you can also get business subscriptions to them. But I'll tell you a couple of favorites. Speaking of ten minutes, this takes ten minutes to learn because I learned this morning and I know that uh, in the cafe. And listen, if I can learn it in ten minutes, I mean, there's people here who can learn it in sixty seconds. Um, but you can make videos with, with cut-ins and, and, and voiceovers and all the kinds of things that you see on television on your phone or with an iPad um, in just minutes. And so this is very popular for newspapers uh, whose, whose, uh, whose journalists have great writing and print skills but are really just beginners when it comes to video and <coughs> 
you know, pictures matter. And, uh, uh, whoa. <laughs> Somebody really thinks they matter. <laughs> That's the video Licious Chat. Okay, we're going away. <laughs> okay. And an another one that I, I like is uh, Poetica, which is a, a, a way of sharing documents and getting comments from your colleagues that's uh, e easier than the Word, the Microsoft Word programming system, which has some, some limitations. So, um, yeah, we've, we've, uh, there are probably 20 of these uh, on the blog post. I won't go through them all. But I would like to say something about robot journalism and transparency. I thought that was an excellent, uh, excellent point. Part of uh, transparency in journalism in the present and future is the ability to um, understand how news bots, um, algorithms, um, open source code works. And that's why we really think in journalism schools there should be partnerships between journalism schools and computer science. If journalists, if people with journalistic souls don't crawl inside this new technology and bend it to their purposes, then we're going to, the future of news will be decided by somebody else. And that's not the first choice. Uh, so so um, there's a legitimate uh, concern about, you know, how much of this should be uh, open source so that people can know what it's doing, build upon it, and it won't be sort of a mystery as to, as to how it works. The other problem with the robot journalism is the exactly the same problem with the infographics. Where does the information come from originally? The fact that a computer has created a, a narrative out of it doesn't, uh, doesn't tell you that much if you don't know where it's actually coming from. And so that's just a few uh, uh, glimpses into the uh, future of... Uh, of transparency, and thank you very much. We've got about 15 minutes left, so rather than I ask the questions, I'd prefer if you ask the questions um, for the panel. Um, I might get a microphone up the front to start. Thank you. It's Masato Kimura, a Japanese journalist. And so my question to Luke, uh, because I wonder uh, what is the originality of BuzzFeed? And so uh, uh, Knight fa found a uh, gentleman uh, explaining about the, uh, the balance of open source and originality. And it's a big question for journalism. And so uh, could you explain more about the originality of BuzzFeed? Originality, how, how do you mean? So originality means, uh, so always a news organization by some source uh, photograph from the, the other organization, it's a copyright. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, how do you overcome such kind of uh, well, issue? the same way every other news organization does. Mo the vast majority of our photos come from photo agencies. You know, Getty is the main one. But then there's, there's a whole wealth of user-generated content, which is great to tap into, so... Uh, Twitter and Instagram are incredible tools. Instagram, in particular, I found really useful if you sort of go beyond the hashtags, which not everyone uses, and, and you sort of search by location. I think that can be a great reporting tool. Uh, Facebook is a bit trickier because if, if, if you have to, uh, someone's Facebook profile has to be set to public, um, so that can be a bit trickier. And um, yeah, and then there's so many other other um, sources of user-generated photos. Uh, so often we find photos on, on Reddit, Tumblr, and so in those cases you need to contact the copyright owner. So Twitter, Twitter and Instagram are the, the sort of main ones and the easiest ones because you can embed those and that sort of ticks that copyright box. Great. Down the front. Hi, I'm Alexandra Buccianti. I work for the BBC's charity. I have a question to Sarah Marshall, actually. Um, I found very interesting this whole thing about putting a personal touch to reporting. But the question is, as journalists, does then the story become about you rather than the story? Um, I think, I mean, in the example of Sam or whatever, I think he's still reporting fact. He's sharing. But, and, of course, you know, we're a newspaper where we very strictly, in print and online, separate comment and fact. So we don't, you know, we have a very strict kind of line that, that is a divide line. Whereas 
you know, perhaps on Twitter, yes, you are adding a little bit of the personality in, but I don't think that story became about Sam in any way. I think it just became a bit like, you know, you being on a phone going, okay, yeah, I'm at the scene, this is what's happening, this is what I can see, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and, you know, this is happening. So I think it's still kind of really, really solid journalism, and, and the, it, in a way, it's, it's more transparent because you kind of know the, the, the process within. Because this was a discussion mm. when, you remember Jeremy Bowen was shot at in Cairo. Mm. People said that the story became about him being shot rather than the story, the unfolding of the events <coughs> in Egypt. So this is a kind of risk that, you know, you, it's kind of debate that's happening right now, so I want to get your view on it. Mm. I don't think it's, so, it's not something that we've kind of had a long debate at inside. It's not something we've kind of come up against, I don't think. I think our journalists are generally you know, they're generally sharing the, the news and they've not been for a, for a, for a while the centre of a, you know, a news story about a person. As a follow-up for that, we were talking earlier this week about one of the issues is social media guidelines for staff. Um, I think the Washington Post and the New York Times have come out with new guidelines this week or last week for social media, journalists that use social media. And I think it's, it, there's a big blur between being... Um, Publishing your opinion on a social platform, whether it be Facebook and Twitter, even if you are a journalist, I think some of the people that were commenting on the social media policies were saying that they were quite restrictive. What's the case in the Wall Street Journal with the social media policy for journalists? I think it's, it's basically about common sense. You know, it's, it wouldn't be common sense for a reporter who was quite so, you know, quite a senior reporter, uh, a news reporter, to then show political <coughs> alliances. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's. I don't know that we have to all have really long reports written. I think it's actually more just about being sensible. You know, you are, you know, whether or not you are, uh, you know, doing reporter, you know, with a with a handle of Sarah Marshall or Sarah Marshall WSJ, you're still essentially a reporter and for the Wall Street Journal. So I think you just have to be sensible. And, you know, when I used to work in radio, I used to kind of say, well, don't say anything on Twitter, you wouldn't say on air. And I think it kind of goes, and I think most journalists don't have a problem with it. Uh, I mean, I'm sure in every organisation there's those examples, but I can't really think of any within ours. Because, you know, I think people have kind of got used to the fact that, you know, they're, they're generally quite experienced reporters and they're not kind of trying to do it, you know, it, it's, it's actually on social media, it's you who look silly if you kind of take the, take the wrong tone rather than your organisation, I think. Do you want to jump in, Eric? Sure. I, I don't know if it's still in there, but I saw a Reuters uh, one maybe a couple of years ago that said in one part of the policy it said, you know, we need to be open. People need to know who we are. And another part of the policy, it said, don't do anything <laughs> that would make anyone think that you have a bias. Mm. So this is the basic uh, problem. But I, 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 common sense has to be a big part of the mm. answer. So if you're an opinion journalist, which there are, you know, there are columnists, there are people who, who, who are advocacy journalists out there in the world, um, then it's natural that you would, that you would do a lot of that. If you're not, um, you know, what, what can you reveal of yourself and of, 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 of uh, your situation that's relevant to the story? So, I mean, if I'm, if I'm tweeting to 100,000 people when I'm shot, that's relevant to them. So I'm not going to be tweeting anymore for a little while. So, I mean, yeah, you know, whether, that, whether somebody else decides that's a story, is, you know, or the news organizations decides that's a story is a separate question. So I, I think the, the important thing is to, is to think about um, you know, the, the transparency that adds to the journalism. The purpose of it is to give people more information and more context to be smarter, um, and not just to say everything there is to say about everything. OK, great. Any questions over here? Thank you. Um, my question is, is the future of journalism in a period are we in danger? Because let's take an example of what's happening in Turkey right now, because we are depending on few outlets of information online, naming Facebook, Twitter, maybe Buzz. When those outlets get locked down in the future, are we going to be able to have access to information? Um, is this anybody in particular? 
for a while, maybe? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just on, on Twitter and um, the YouTube and the Twitter band. I mean, I've done a lot of reporting on that for BBC World News over the last week. And I think it actually shows that it's very hard to shut down any part of the internet, whether you're a government or an organisation, because it's what the internet is, it's a network of network, it's people, the Turkish, um, not only reporters, but newspapers online, they were all revealing details of how you circumnavigate any type of block. Um, to, and, that, and the percentage of people that were tweeting out of, out of Turkey in the day after the ban was up 300%. So, I don't, I don't think those kind of blocks and bans will, will, will will have an effect on journalism, if anything, we draw it to I think it's actually putting the eyes of the world on Turkey. Yeah, as much as the eyes of the world is there, it's preventing people from shouting out and sharing information. So in a way, the Turkish government is wrong about the law. We, we speech there. I don't agree. I actually think they've made their voices louder. They're being reported and they're using VPNs and they're using DNSs and they're getting around that ban and their, their story is actually stronger. The opposition is. Yeah, well, how much what about North reach, Korea? How many people can they reach? Those few people still logging out there. How many people can they reach if they don't have Twitter connected? Did somebody say North Korea? I did. <laughs> Other things. Do you want to talk about situation in North Korea? Listen, I have an observation about the future. I mean, the more people know, the less they're able to predict the future. The less people know, the more they're able to predict the future. So if you run into anything that can predict the future, they're not going to be smart. The, the, we just don't know. We don't know. This is, you're getting into, you go, go ahead five or 10, 15, 20 years, and you, you're in science fiction. You know, because today we're in science fiction of 20 years ago. Things that were, you know, <laughs> thought to be crazy and couldn't possibly happen. That's now a routine in the digital age. So, you know, these are tools. And whether they free humanity or enslave us is up to the humans, not up to the tools. And that's why I, I, sort, of, I sort of disagree with the technological determinists who say, you know, there will be this kind of future because this technology is so fantastic. I, I think the future is an open question. Uh, and so uh, they make, the tools make uh, it possible for voices to be heard that could never be heard before. But they also make it possible to, to be turned off. And, and, and without alternative mechanisms being, in, all, in some cases, being available. So it's, it's uh, you know, if you, if you want to know what the future is, the best thing to do is to immerse yourself in, in today's science fiction. And you'll live long enough to see a significant amount of it come through. The, 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 the fiction writers are actually far closer to what actually is going to happen than the, the expert predictors, because there's always some unanticipated combination of inventions and developments that, that makes things go off into a completely different direction. Well, can I just say, sorry, can I just say that's not the future. It's happening now. And it happened right. in Egypt as well. Right, so you can argue both sides of the internet. Right, and you can argue both sides of the internet. The internet right. gives people the ability to get information that they can't There's a second there's a second point here about human beings and what we think uh, of our immediate surroundings. There was a book uh, called Angels of Our uh, Better Nature, uh, written by uh Pintak in the United States. And he statistically shows how human life has dramatically improved over the last 500 years by almost every statistical measure. And yet we think things have gone to hell. And all along they thought that. And there's something about our, our protests against things that are wrong and our oversensitivity to problems that makes us want to continue to improve things. That's probably the fact that you're not happy about what's happening is probably the best hope for humanity. So don't ever be happy about that. <laughs> you talked in your, your, your last talk, Eric, about how all journalists should learn how to code. Um, how important is it, do you think it is, not just for journalists, but editors and news organisations to really adapt to new technologies as they come on board? Well, I mean, let me just clarify, there, there's different types of coding. 
So, I mean, you know, basic code is really very really easy. Um, really, so super sophisticated code is a different, is a different matter. Not every journalist is probably going to be able to get that deep into it. But the ones who uh, have, are bilingual in the sense that they can talk to technologists and they can work with technologists, they know enough to be able to do that, uh, have employment records coming out of school where they're getting high level jobs and they're employable to a degree that's like, you know, 50, 60, 70% higher than the normal employment rate. So, you know, my, my son is a graphic art artist and decided to teach himself to code and tripled his starting salary and is doing as an interface designer, which I would argue is a graphic artist who can, you know, code. And, and I really think that this is becoming part of basic media literacy in the digital age. And um, well, the reason I agree with you is, is it's just about are you going to let your tools dictate what you can do, or are you going to be able to dictate to your tools what you want to happen? Not being able to code at some basic level, not having enough of a grasp of computers to be able to do more than just take what it will give you is a bit like being on a typewriter that will only let you type certain words 50 years ago. It's an anachronistic position to be in, I think. I'm just going to take maybe one more question. Yeah. Maybe one or two more questions before we... And I have been told to tell you, I think it's, um, I have to have an Irish woman, that there's free drinks afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so stick around for this. <laughs> as the role and capability, oh, I'm Carl Allen, I'm a pensioner. As the role and capabilities of citizen journalists keep increasing, what then will become the role and functions of professional journalists? Mm -hmm. All the change. You want to take it? Because you, you, you use a lot of citizen journalism, UGC content. What do you think the role of BuzzFeed is in that when you have well, other content think, makers? Yeah, like, like, like any new news organization, we can rely a lot on news generating content, especially you know, people tweeting from, from uh, places that we're reporting on. But uh, what, what you need is a, a journalist you can put in context, obviously. But then I think what we bring to topics. Um, is the ability to make it accessible. Yeah. So if you have something that's going on in the world, how do you how do you uh, present it in, in a way that just flows up across the social web and everyone's sharing it and everyone's understanding it? Uh, so that's that's what a BuzzFeed journalist brings to a news story. Is there a Wall Street Journal? So I think I mean it's kind of one of those things where I've, I've heard this question before, and I, I don't think there's any kind of uh, you know. They can both live really neatly side by side or, or intertwined. You know, being able to have so many people on the ground with smartphones, you can send stuff in and make journalism kind of better. And be, you know, when you can see something, then and have it verified, then you know, you've got sources all around the world that you don't have before. That's not going to mean there's any fewer jobs for the rest of the journalists amongst us, or I mean that we, you still don't need us to put them in context. But you know, just imagine some of the kind of world events from you know 10, 15 years ago, of, you know, the towers coming down. Just think about how they would be now, and actually how we would treat them as journalists. Well, you still need the journalist to kind of make sense of the story, but actually having all that, those images from people and how they are affected, just makes for better journalism and more transparency. Does anybody have a question that they're dying to ask and don't want to leave the room without asking? This, lady no, this is more of a nibble than a question. <laughs> you know you have um, on BuzzFeed, you choose the amount of photos. How do you choose that number? Because it's very well in 29, why 29? <laughs> <laughs> um, people often ask that. Um, there used to be a school of thought, this is years ago, that uh, number 26 was particularly, uh, particularly, particularly effective. Uh, but basically, the answer is we don't think about it at all. I and mean, we try and avoid 10 or 20 because that just sounds like you're not trying. <laughs> <laughs> so to be honest, the, the reason for the, the numbers, I think partly it's, it's a, little, a little sort of signal to the reader that, hey, this article is not going to take you that long to read it. Um, so that, that, that kind of helps with the sort of, the sort of clickability and accessibility of an article. Um, the other thing is it really helps with the shareability because people like to pick out individual bits. So when they, they tweet an article, They'll send it to their friends and they'll say, oh my god, number six, that's so you. And uh, so that element of it really comes into play when it comes to the show. Okay, I think that's everything. Thank Thanks for the <laughs>